On behalf of the organizing committee, uh, consisting from uh, Ion Andrzejopoulos, Leslie Barrett, Adam Myers, and Daniel Priodis Pedro, we would like to welcome you to this uh, virtual edition of uh, uh, this year's Natural Legal Language Processing Workshop uh, co located with uh, KDD. It's, uh, it's very unfortunate, actually, that uh, during this pandemic, uh, we couldn't uh, held an online, uh, sorry, an in-person uh, event because of the pandemic, because San Diego is a great city. And uh, I'm very jealous that I'm, I'm not there today and I'm in Sheffield with a pleasant uh, 17 degrees. Uh, so, uh, let's crack on. Uh, why we do this, uh, this workshop, uh, our main aim is to bring together data science, artificial intelligence, and natural language processing and uh, machine learning uh, together with the local communities in order to foster collaboration between these areas, discuss applications in the legal domain, and also identify, and, uh, identify challenges and formulate targets and priorities uh, for computational appro approaches to legal test to the legal text and uh, I think we think that this is a fascinating area where AI and natural language processing can uh, offer uh, advances and it's not it's not about not only about the, the practical and industrial applications uh, per se but uh, I think it's very fascinating from uh, uh, the point of view of uh, empirical law uh, helping uh, legal scholars to uh, answer research questions using uh, computational approaches. So, uh, uh, with that in mind, uh, this year we uh, accepted uh, five types of uh, papers. So, we were looking for uh, new applications of uh, uh, data science, uh, well, call it whatever you like, AI and natural language processing or machine learning uh, applications to legal tasks. Uh, we also uh, welcome papers on empirical and experimental studies adapting well-known machine learning approaches to uh, legal uh, documents and uh, tasks. Uh, we also welcome uh, the, the proposal and uh, definition of, uh, of new tasks um, on uh, uh, legal tasks that can be tackled with uh, computational approaches. And also, uh, we welcome uh, papers on resources, which is the backbone of uh, actually doing uh, AI uh, and machine learning, uh, modern machine learning in uh, the legal domain. Finally, uh, we also uh, uh, welcome papers uh, that describe uh, systems, demos, uh, practical applications of, uh, of these systems, and also including uh, papers on uh, industrial research. Uh, we have received uh, in total 23 uh, submissions and we have accepted uh, 12. Uh, six out of uh, 12 are long papers. We have four short papers and uh, two non-archival papers. I think one has been already accepted in, uh, in their speech and uh, the other one uh, is part of a uh, longer journal submission. So, uh, each paper has uh, received uh, three or more uh, reviews and uh, we would like to thank our amazing 35 uh, reviewers that helped us um, providing high quality uh, assessment and feedback to the submissions that we have received. Uh, I would like also to uh, note that uh, our program committee, given the topic of, uh, of the workshop, consists of people that have either uh, expertise in um, uh, computer science, machine learning, and AI, and also we have uh, reviewers that uh, come from uh, from the legal domain, and uh, more specifically have experience in uh, applying machine learning and AI uh, in the legal domain. So today's schedule. Uh, I mean, we start. We probably might be a couple of minutes uh, uh, late already. Uh, we uh, consists of. Uh, six sessions. We will start with uh, an invited talk uh, by Paul Nimitz and then we will have uh, four sessions uh, where the authors uh, are going to present uh, uh, the accepted papers and finally we will close with uh, a virtual town hall where we uh, welcome all of the participants to provide feedback and uh, 
participate in uh, discussions on how we can improve uh, future editions of, uh, of the workshop. Well, again, due to the uh, difficult circumstances this year, the workshop is uh, self-paced. So we have all the pre-recorded videos. Uh, we will have all the pre-recorded uh, videos in uh, VFairs for all of the archival papers. Well, we sometimes have to um, contend. All right. Can you please mute your mics? Uh, just, OK. Right, so. Um, we will have all the pre-recorded videos in VFairs for all the archival papers, and this is going to be made available during the conference and 30 days after by. Also, we're going to have uh, uh, the KDD Vimeo on YouTube uh, uh, recordings after the conference, and also uh, you can find the you could find the proceedings uh, online on uh, uh, CU uh, Care uh, WS repo and on this, following this link. Of course, uh, we decided this year to, uh, uh, instead of uh, presenting the pre-recorded talks and uh, ask the, the authors to participate in live QAs, uh, I thought, we thought that uh, it, is, uh, it would be much more interesting to, uh, to, held, uh, the, to hold a full virtual uh, live event, so we'll, uh, we are going to use Zoom uh, and we're going to have live presentations, uh, uh, talks and uh, Q&A sessions. So for uh, the Q&A sessions, we're going to use Zoom chat, so basically you can uh, ask uh, questions after uh, each talk and then we can uh, 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 convey the, the, we can uh, actually ask the, the authors to answer uh, the question. So we're going to use Zoom chat for that. But also uh, discussions can uh, uh, be held on uh, social media. On Twitter you can use the NL NLP uh, hashtag and also relevant hashtags such as legal tech and NLPROC for uh, getting the discussion uh, on uh, uh, social media and having something more permanent there. Uh, right, finally for the virtual town hall, uh, the main goal is to get together and discuss uh, highlights, what you like from uh, uh, this two, uh, from this year's version and if you have uh, actually attended last year's uh, uh, edition in NACL, what do you like from, uh, from the workshop? Also, we are very interested to identify what are the low lights and how we can uh, make uh, uh, NLP uh, better, and also uh, we can discuss uh, future directions, uh, for example, which areas uh, are important to focus, and uh, something that we would love to introduce in, uh, in the third edition, it would be a shared task and ideas for uh, actually uh, uh, organizing a shared task. Also, uh, unless you are not during uh, working hours, you are welcome to bring your own drink. So uh, now, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce uh, to introduce you our uh, invited uh, uh, speaker, Paul Nimitz, who is a principal advisor in the uh, Directorate General for Justice and uh, Consumers of the European Commission. Uh, Paul was appointed by the European Commission uh, uh, three years ago, and. Uh, he works on reforming uh, uh, the data protection legislation of uh, the European Union, and uh, he is uh, he takes part in the negotiations of uh, the EU and uh, US Privacy Shield and uh, uh, other negotiations with major US internet uh, companies uh, related to the EU uh, Code of Conduct against against uh, incitement to violence and hate speech. Uh, on the internet. Uh, before joining the Directorate General for Justice and Consumers, Paul held posts in the legal service of uh, the European Commission, the Cabinet of the Commissioner for Development of uh, Cooperation in the Directorate General for Trade, Transport and Maritime Affairs, and uh, also he is a visiting professor of law at the College of Europe uh, uh, in Greece and member of the board of uh, excuse my German here, I don't 
don't know if it is German, Verein gegen Werkesen für Demokratie. I don't know if I uh, uh, got that correct. So Paul today is going to talk about AI for language, democracy and uh, fundamental rights. Uh, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. <clears throat> and uh, if uh, the connection is no good, please tell me, then I will turn off um, the video and we'll just have a language link. I will speak about uh, three points. First, what is the Commission doing in uh, the area of law and AI, um, or let's say law and digitalization? That's where I see uh, the place also for natural legal language processing. Uh, second, um, what are uh, the principles which we look to in particular right now, uh, the principles for AI in the judiciary um, as developed by the Council uh, uh, of Europe, a committee on the judiciary and the Hamburg principles on judicial review of AI in public administration. And then third, I want to give you some broader thoughts to inspire you uh, in your further work the thoughts which are basically fragments from my forthcoming book on uh, power, um, democracy and freedom in the age of artificial intelligence. Uh, fragments which um, uh, treat the relationship between technology, democracy and the law. So first of all, what is the Commission doing? Um, as so often in our policy development cycle, we are studying right now, we have a study ongoing, an empirical study on where in the judiciary um, we are with digitalization and in particular where in the judiciary AI technologies are used. Uh, the study identifies tools in order to support and facilitate the work in the judiciary um, uh, but also uh, national authorities which apply the law and in law firms. Um, we see some preliminary results from member states which are developing tools in a wide area, um, including anonymization and pseudonymization tools for court decisions, speech-to-text transcription, automated analysis of high volumes of digital information, chatbots supporting citizens to find the right information when they first approach a public administrations or the judiciary, Ah, uh, Paul, sorry to interrupt. Uh, if, if you are sharing something, uh, we're not seeing your screen. Uh, I'm not sharing anything. All right. I'm okay. just I was, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm sharing, right. I have shared the link uh, to, uh, and the title uh, to the book in the, in the, in the chat. In the chat. Right. I thanks don't have slides. Okay, thanks. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so I was saying uh, chatbots to guide citizens in a who, when they first have a first informational approach to the judiciary or public administrations, to guide them to the right contacts, um, automated analysis of high volumes of information, um, automated manual repeating processes, and so on. Um, so this is the empirics, and uh, we are thinking about coming forward with a policy uh, um, paper, which uh, in the Commission we call communication, a white paper, um, which may set out some of our thoughts on uh, future policy development in this area uh, in uh, the winter or beginning of next year. So as you can see, it's rather vague. We are in a finding uh, period. Um, I have personally visited a number of trade fairs uh, for law firms and the judiciary and I have to be honest with you, I was generally quite disappointed, you know, always sounds great, AI this, AI that, but then if you look at the applications, they are pretty rudimentary, uh, basically word search, uh, nothing really hot I have seen, but if you have seen hot stuff, I'm uh, looking forward to our discussion. So. Um, this is uh, the, the first uh, point I wanted to make, just to uh, keep you updated on uh, policy developments. Second, um, we already have two um, texts which may be relevant for your work in Europe. They are not legally binding, but they're interesting for orientation. Uh, first, the Council of Europe a Committee on the Judiciary um, developed uh, principles on AI in the judiciary. Uh, which um, are basically uh, setting out a number of rules 
um, you know, relating to the transparency and the needs of the judiciary not uh, to be taken over by technology, emphasizing that final decisions always are made by humans um, and judges and so on. And um, a similar paper going in the more specifically into AI in the public administration and what this means for judicial review of the work of public administrations by courts. Both papers um, stress that uh, the principle of um, motivation of decisions by the state um, is vital and must be maintained when technologies um, come to play to take automated decisions in the public administration. Um, this point is important because um, the, those who sell AI technologies uh, today try, uh, let's say, to convince people that um, um, you know, the programs are so precise and so good and that their performance would go down if too many explanations how the neural networks come to decisions uh, would be required and therefore um, it would be better not to ask for uh, um, uh, explanations but rather uh, do ex post checks of whether decisions are correct or not and if they turn to, out to be statistically uh, you know, overwhelmingly correct then it, um, an explanation is not necessary. This is something which in both documents uh, which we now have in Europe has been rejected the principle of motivation of state action is core for the judicial review of state actions and the control of our executives by courts is of course a vital part of the rule of law and such a control by the judiciary is only possible if decisions are motivated and uh, honestly speaking you know if i have um, if i'm in a little bit hotter climate than uh, where i'm today i'm in glasgow it's quite rainy and cold here but uh, I can get quite excited about it. I would say that uh, the principle that decisions of the state must be explained and motivated and can be reviewed by courts, uh, this is really a great achievement of enlightenment and the rule of law, and uh, we cannot have, uh, have it that technology takes this away. So one thing is also clear uh, from the discussions in these circles, and, and we had a number of those, we have integrated these papers in our work with a number of presidencies, that um, programs like COMPASS in the United States, which uh, gives um, in an automated way uh, predictions on uh, likely reoffending and uh, therefore prepares or may even take decisions on parole in criminal law, uh, these programs if ever they would be used in Europe, which they I don't think are, um, would be subject to full judicial review. It is inconceivable that in criminal law procedures um, such um, uh, software is used um, uh, to prepare even the decision of the judge uh, without the full right uh, of defense to look uh, uh, into this process. So what we have seen in the United States that the company objected uh, uh, on the basis of tra trade secrets uh, law uh, to a uh, full scrutiny of the program, I think in Europe is uh, inconceivable. So much um, on, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the specificities. Let me now um, move a little bit further on some general thoughts uh, which uh, can be of interest to your work. There are, of course, areas of law which are amenable to machine understanding of the language of the law. And I would say, to make it simple, the more the law is numerical and the more the law um, is uh, not uh, based on complex language opening up discretions, uh, discretion or uh, scope of interpretation, the more it is amenable uh, to uh, machine treatment. And my thesis for you would be, you are very likely or more likely to find this type of law in the area of delegated legislation. So legislation which is not coming from the primary legislator, namely constitutional law or, or law passed by democratic bodies like parliaments, but the type of law which is delegated from parliaments and legislators to executives, and then executives pass regulation. So in the European Union, um, 
this is a classic process accompanied by so-called comitology that you know details of certain provisions can be trashed out uh, only by the commission or only by the council and you also find this in member states that parliament delegates to the government to the executive the further lawmaking so to be very practical in eu law we have you know weekly rules on pricing in agriculture of you know what is the intervention price for this or that product and the commission constantly makes here um, delegated laws to adapt to the market situation and this type of law is probably uh, uh, more amenable to treatment by uh, machines uh, and maybe even making and application by machines than parliamentary law. I would also say that for uh, uh, avoiding discussions about the legitimacy of your work, it is actually smart to go into this area because this area is more under the control of the executive precisely because parliaments consider that political scrutiny of such law is of less importance. And there are some projects, for example, in the OECD to standardize traffic rules um, and to make uh, traffic signs completely machine readable and traffic law to make it completely machine applied in view of the needs of automated driving, to just give you this example. And classically, the deep speed and so on, a matter of delegated legislation. This is not something which is in parliamentary law. So um, I think, therefore, to close this idea on delegated le legislation, you will find two advantages for your work. First, it is more likely to be less complex in terms of language. It is going to be rather clear. It's not going to be very political language because the political lawmaker exactly down-delegated it to the executive because, you know, it's a rather a simple matter and not so much of political nature. And second, when you move in with technology in this area, you don't get into so complicated debates as you may get in the higher level of law, namely parliamentary law. And here I would like to share with you a thought which I develop in my book. In a number of our member states, we already have empowerments in secondary law, meaning law by the parliamentary legislator. So this is not delegated lawmaking. This is the classic parliamentary lawmaking. And these empowerments say that automation is allowed in the government, in administrative law, provided that there's a specific law allowing for automation in a certain area and provided the automation doesn't cover decisions which require uh, the exercise of a um, margin of appreciation or discretion. And I will not go into the difference, uh, typical German difference between margin of appreciation and discretion. Suffice it to say, margin of appreciation is on the term, on the conditions of the law, on the wording. Appreciation is if all conditions are fulfilled, the state still has a choice to make. This is called uh, uh, discretion. So, so the law provides this because it is about automation. And one of the questions which I'm asking myself and others, including you, is are these empowerments, which have been put into the law five, six, seven, eight years ago, sufficient to introduce decision-making by artificial intelligence? Why is this a thorny question? This is a thorny question because artificial intelligence is more than just simple automation. At the time when these laws were made, the idea was we introduce automation, for example, in tax law, and the program is a simple if-then constellation, namely that you know if a certain amount of income is reached, then the amount of tax to be paid is this. So it is a mechanistical view of how automation should proceed. At the time, 
the materials in uh, which led uh, the member states to adopt these clauses do not show that they were thinking already about self-learning programs as we now find them in machine learning, neural networks, and artificial types of artificial intelligence. So my thesis would be that those first-generation empowerments to um, apply automation in public administrative decision-making do not cover artificial intelligence, which learns itself autonomously, moves on, and, and, and develops its decision-making practice. But for such type of new artificial intelligence decision-making, a new empowerment is necessary. And I would argue that a clear sign that self-learning was not wanted is also the fact that discretion and appreciation have ex explicitly been excluded. Now, if one would use artificial intelligence, of course, one of the goals would be to standardize the exercise of um, discretion and margins of appreciation and, and, and the filling in of margins of appreciation through the learning of the program. And since these elements of learning were explicitly excluded, I would say we need uh, uh, new empowerments uh, in the law, and uh, I hope uh, that this work is, is going to move forward. So, um, to be very practical, you find such empowerments already in a number of areas. Of course, you find it in traffic law, you know, the classic tickets. You find them in taxation law, and you also find them in social law, uh, where it is about um, <clears throat> Um, you know, uh, uh, unemployment and, and social aid um, and, and so on. So, um, now let me uh, move on uh, to some thoughts which are broader and which are fragments of my forthcoming book called uh, The Human Imperative, Power, Democracy, um, and freedom in the age of artificial intelligence. In this book, which I've written together with a philosopher, we are trying to uh, square the circle, so to say, between uh, the new technologies uh, of artificial intelligence, the new power relations between technology and democracy, and what this all means for more uh, for um, for the making of law and for the good functioning. Um, of uh, uh, of uh, democracy, and um, I'm uh, the book is um, oscillates between criticism of the status quo um, and the pointing out of philosophical um, avenues of orientation, um, and in the last chapter, and I hope we get to this, we plead for a much more intense dialogue between what we call the technical intelligentsia, the engineering world and social sciences, democracy, and the law. And um, I would say that natural language, uh, um, uh, legal language processing and natural language processing in itself is exactly a lieu where this type of dialogue has to take place at all times and is actually taking place in our work workshop today, but also all the big discussions about um, language algorithms like GPT-2 and GPT-3 and so on are proof of this. So I definitely see, uh, uh, let's say, a prise de responsabilité, a taking on of responsibility in the technical world for uh, the um, legal and uh, political and uh, also human rights uh, impacts um, of, of their technologies. And when we talk about language, just to say this before I start reading, um, let's be clear that language technology is among the most sensitive of AI technology. Why? Because language is how we perceive the world and language is the tool of democracy. So those who will master the machines of language may have the power to be extremely influential, much more influential than they are already now in democracy. And therefore we have to think about the checks and balances we put on um, language technologies in the spirit 
of those who say, and I happen to be among those, that the control of technical power is one of the great tasks of democracy and uh, rule of law today. So now I move on to how we describe, uh, to a first fragment, how we describe artificial intelligence in the book. And I, uh, this is a fragment, so I seek your criticism and uh, your reflections on this in the discussion afterwards. The term artificial intelligence suggests human capabilities for problem solving, which technology cannot offer at present and in all probability will not be able to achieve quickly. To ask intelligence questions, to criticize, to penetrate complex social, political, and scientific questions in a thinking way, these features of human intelligence AI is yet to achieve. State or, uh, of the art AI cannot even master the rules of physics at present. Therefore, Facebook has launched a test program that can be used to check whether an AI simulates mechanically, mechanical physics correctly, not to mention causality, time and space relationships, which are still a long way from being handled properly by AI. Stuart Russell, one of the most important researchers in the field of AI, combines technical knowledge with social responsibility and the ambition to communicate the complex subject to a broad public. He recalls that humans have various forms of intelligence and can use them simultaneously. They can read, write, calculate and speculate, speak and sing, make music, paint. They have physical movement intelligence, social and emotional intelligence and wit. They love, hate and feel compassion. They can deploy these faculties at the same time and blend them together. A program of today's AI like AlphaGo of DeepMind can win against humans in the game Go. But other than that, AI is currently unable to establish a correlation between various forms of intelligence. What AI can currently do is calculate and optimize starting from a data set to which a learning program is applied. This is called machine learning. Roughly speaking, machine learning is being developed and already applied in three areas today. Image recognition and analysis, analysis of unstructured data, and human speech and language processing. Today, machine learning must refer to a very specific area and is narrowly limited, for example, only to image recognition in the diagnosis of breast cancer. It is in this area, as well as in unstructured data, that ML is most advanced. It is still weakest in the understanding and creation of language. The fact that language is now properly translated and properly transcribed. Sorry, I just have to do a little operation here to put um, some energy into my telephone to be able to continue talking. <clears throat> so, um, the fact that language can be correctly transcribed that short texts for facts for journalistic purposes based on figures in the field of stock market reports and sports are written by AI should not expose us to the illusion that AI is capable of free understanding language creation. Major conceptual breakthrough would, would be needed to create AI with human capabilities such as language comprehension, integration of learning and knowledge, and the cumulative collection of concepts and knowledge. In other words, wisdom will not reach AI in the long run. What AI can already do, how it develops, how much it is invested, where and how much AI engineers can earn is the subject of intensive annual reports which are themselves part of the hype about AI. Machine learning always refers to existing data. It, it asks empirics. What Kant and Hume taught us is that one cannot conclude from being to what should be. This is a big hurdle for machine learning, which is always based on being. It only reaches beyond optimization processes to a limited extent. It cannot dream and be creative, and it can certainly not determine a shell. It has no power of imagination. Of course, 
AI can paint pictures in a new way or compose something that sounds quite pleasant and new. But in these examples, rules are applied, then perhaps used to create minor variations around certain elements. This has nothing to do with creativity and the finely tuned intuition of the human artist. Even if machines were fed with the enormous data about man-made works of art, they could still not create real art because they lack corporality, they lack the feeling, they lack the joy and pain, and they lack the awareness of their own finiteness. Please get in touch with us. If you discover an AI that composes good songs with interesting lyrics, that creates a new leap in music, such as the development of 12-tone music by Arnold Schoenberg or punk rock, and so on. So this is the first um, 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 excerpt, and we now move on to the description of the specific investments in language. What all GAFAM, and this is Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft, what all those, we call them GAFAM together, have in common is their work on the next big thing, namely meaningful speech comprehension and the creating creation of meaningful speech. Will it be possible to move all speech processing to the edge, to the devices using edge computer, computing? Apple Siri, Google's BERT, Amazon's Alexa's, and Microsoft's investments in open AI and its speech algorithms IBM Watson Debater, all these projects point in a similar direction. The centrality of language for our understanding of the world and for communication in various, govern in various governance systems makes it the core technology par excellence. Those who can control and automatically create and understand meaningful language can fully master governance systems from democracy to law to stock markets to science. Fake news will then become the least of our problems. It is therefore extremely important not only to follow the development of AI language technology closely, but also to be right there with it and to regulate it properly. No human being should ever talk or communicate in writing with a machine or AI without him or her, uh, without him or her believing it, no, while uh, him or her believing it is a human on the other side. We need a legal obligation for transparency in the use of this technology to ensure that we always know whether we communicate with a machine. Now I jump a little bit because it's... Um, it's quite a lot uh, we have been writing about um, uh, language as a tool for democracy and its intersubjectivity function. Um, let me maybe um, give you a few quotes from our chapter, The Erosion of Language, Self-Determination and Democracy and Its Consequences. Josef Weizenbaum said, The rhetoric of the technical elite has corrupted language. The erosion of language has played a decisive role in the triumphal procession of the California ideology. And of course, the California ideology is a big part of our analysis. It is the ideology of technology being able to do anything and solve all problems of this world. The function of language to understand and open up the world for us is being undermined in dataism. Statements that refer to moral correctness or aesthetic authenticity no longer have any meaning in such a conception of language. The openness and ambiguity of natural language is seen as a disadvantage compared to the ambig apparent ambiguity and ambiguity of cybernetic signals. The potential for creativity, dreams, criticism, and the reinvention of oneself and the world fade into the background. Neither technology nor mathematics or physics can produce the language they need to describe their own discoveries and inventions. It is precisely during the development of new technology 
when we need new images of language, new words, new sentences to, to describe the changes. What cannot be explained by language is hardly accessible to humans. This must be remembered when companies declare that they cannot explain how AI comes to its results and decides. AI can only make, quote, decisions, quote, off on the basis of old data. But new ways only result from the openness of language and human imagination. If language no longer has any reference to truth or moral correctness, but is a mere signal that serves to attract attention or control processes, this opens up opportunities for its abuse and the weakening of democracy as we experience it today. Let me uh, close by saying the following. The law is written best in the age of technology in the technologically neutral manner. What does this mean? This means that the law must be written in such a way that it changes meaning over time, namely in light of the technological developments and the development of business models. Good law is not like code, which is written for stupids. Who are the stupids the code is written for? The stupids are the computers. Computers cannot think themselves. That's why they need the constant update of the code whenever we discover that something doesn't work well. The law is completely different. The law is written for human beings. Human beings can think themselves and reinterpret the law in light of the new times. So the best law and the longest lasting law is the law on the constitutional level uh, or law which in secondary legislation delivers on constitutional rights, which often perdures for decades or even centuries. And this law has the ability to be reinterpreted by human beings, by those who apply it, by the legal community, by science, and in fine, of course, by judges, and it changes its meaning over time. And I think with all the sympathy for the potential of using machines in the process of the law and for natural legal language processing, with all its potential to make the law more accessible, to drive down prices of legal services, to be a social factor which delivers the law to more people with all these positive potentials, I at least also seek the solidarity of those who develop this technology and come from the technological side and their understanding for the fact that we cannot apply and we should never apply the logic of engineering to the making of law in democratic process in a, uh, to the law which is the noblest expression of democracy and which we create to guide our society on the big and to shape it uh, on the big issues. So that's why I am very proud uh, of the GDPR, for example, because there I think we have managed more or less to create a law which is technology neutral and which will stay in place and have meaning over a long, long time. But the meaning in concreto will change with technological process. For example, what is personal data in tomorrow will be different than what is personal data today because the definition of what is personal data is technologically neutral. Namely, it just says, if there is data which identifies a person or makes it possible to identify a person, then it is personal data. And tomorrow, more possibilities will exist to identify people then exists today. Therefore, the real meaning of the law actually changes with technology. So thank you very much for your attention and for inviting me. And I'm very happy uh, to discuss with you uh, some of these ideas. Thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, that was very interesting. So uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. So uh, if you have uh, a question for Paul, you can basically just use your mic or just uh, write your question on the chat. I don't know if we, if we can use, uh, we cannot raise hands here, but 
yeah, uh, just feel free to unmute and uh, ask your question. Any questions? I have one question. Um, Paul, nowadays in machine learning, there is uh, quite a movement towards transparency of various algorithms and against bias. Um, I don't know if you follow that, but do you feel like efforts to that effect would perhaps change your mind about some of the NLP applications that you were discussing? I would say the more transparency um, uh, we have and the more um, judges and also the public are able to control the exact functioning of um, algorithms, the more it is likely that it will find acceptance in politics, in the general public, and but then also in legal process. So um, I'm a, a pretty uh, orthodox, you know, my view is to make it very simple, unexplained so algorithms which don't explain the decisions cannot be used in the exercise of public power. It's as simple as that. If you want to sell your algorithm to governments, um, to states, in, for the exercise of public power, they must come up with explanations for the decisions. Otherwise, it would be illegal to use them. So the answer to your question is yes. If explanation is delivered, of the individual decisions taken, the likelihood that these programs can be used increases. Thanks. Uh, so if uh, is anyone, does anyone have a question? I have a quick one. Uh, okay, uh, thanks Paul, that was really, that was really interesting. So uh, my question is about uh, access to justice and uh, uh, I would like to, to hear your views on uh, uh, improving access to justice by using AI, not trying to replace judges, uh, but uh, rather assisting lawyers and legal, uh, legal firms. Uh, do you think that this might be uh, a better way of uh, uh, using AI in the legal domain? Yes, I think um, there, um, I think you will be um up uh, against uh, less obstacles of constitutional law nature. It's more an economic question. And there are some examples, which um, we are trying to follow this field quite closely, which are uh, fascinating. Um, so, for example, um, there's a German uh, law firm and programming house called Reitmart, which has completely automated the checking of social benefits. And... Um, they check in a program for free the social benefits uh, decisions which you get and they have a 95 or 99 percent hit rate of them in their program getting it right and winning against the state and this has really helped a lot of people who are already the poorest of the poor because before no lawyer would take up a case which is about let's say one euro a month or 50 cents a month but this is actually important money for people who, who are on the dole and so this technology, this firm, it's not AI, I think it is strictly mechanistic, has extended the reach of the law and ensures that everybody really gets to the cent what is their right to get, and that's a good thing. So I, I would encourage uh, uh, this type of project. Thanks. And a quick follow-up. Uh, actually, that's more on the legislation side. Uh, I, I'm not quite familiar on, uh, I mean, I'm quite familiar on the efforts on GDPR and uh, introducing this kind of uh, legislation in pan-European level. Uh, could you share us uh, uh, your views or your knowledge on what are what actually are the the efforts from the European Union to enforce uh, uh, member states to actually uh, apply this legislation in, uh, in, in, in national level? Well, the normal process uh, in the European Union is member states apply EU law uh, correctly and, um, you know, GDPR is a relatively new area of law. It is complex, uh, so we are following uh, very closely. We do reports on the implementation and um, there is a body... Um, in which the national data protection authorities coordinate their implementation work. 
uh, which, you know, is learning to work together and it's all very slow. And, you know, this is normal in the, in the rule of law. You know, sometimes if things are getting complex, nothing moves fast. Um, but I'm confident that the mutual learning uh, will lead to a higher dynamic of implementation uh, in the longer run. Uh, not the least uh, because of the activities of civil society. I mean, for our data protection authorities, it is simply new to realize that they will end up before the courts, the administrative courts anyway. In the past, when they didn't act, they really didn't have anything to fear. They just didn't do anything, and that was fine. Now, under GDPR, citizens have a right to action, and... The, um, in, in a number of member states, the NGOs can also on their own, without having individual citizens' uh, cases at hand, enforce this right to action. And there are a number of associations in Europe which are making this their main aim. And so I think um, we are seeing more and more uh, DPAs being taken to court uh, and held responsible for non-action. And I think this will increase the dynamics over time. Thanks. Uh, any other questions to Paul? So actually we can uh, break for four minutes and come back uh, at, uh, uh, well, here is uh, 5 uh, p.m. Uh, for uh, the first session. Uh, Paul, thanks again. That was uh, really fascinating and uh, hope to see you soon. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Have a good conference. Thank you very much. Please. I will still listen a little bit. Of course, yeah. I mean, yeah, please, uh, please feel free. <laughs> yeah, your interesting papers. I have read some of them. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.